Who here kind of is familiar with the expression VUCA? Yeah, okay, so that sort of sounds like a disease. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's about the business context that we're navigating. It's, it's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So I want to check I didn't get that all wrong there. Um, the reason why Mean Girls has, has stood behind these um, letters is because it kind of reminds me of being a teenage girl. Um, so it's, there's a lot going on. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so my role in us two is to help people navigate that complexity um, we um, want to support people to be able to embrace self-organising and also to collaborate really closely together to deliver their best work. So um, actually acknowledging that that's a challenging context is, um, is kind of the first part on the journey. And this echoes really nicely the, the work that we do for our clients. So our work is... Um, we're a digital product studio, so that might not mean a lot to anybody. Um, so it's a, an interesting mix of things. Um, but we make, um, we make apps and websites, and we work in client-facing business, but we also um, do our own IP. Um, we also have a game studio. Um, so we were originally founded um, by these two guys, very serious businessmen. Um, so Mills and Sinks have been best friends um, for kind of forever, and um, and they founded us two, um, hence the name, um, in 2004. Um, and um, what I really like about us two, and something that I've personally really um, got a lot out of, is that friendship continues to be this really kind of foundational um, value in in the organisation. And Mills actually refers to the company as a fampany, um, so this idea of blending family and company together. Um, so um, something I thought was actually really interesting was that um, I think nearly, I think it was 97, 98% of us Tubies told us um, recently in a, one of our surveys that we do um, that they have a best friend, someone they trust at work. And I think that that as a, as a kind of human need um, that's being served in the workplace is a really important thing. Um, so this is the kind of thing Mills tweets. I highly recommend following him if you want to be kind of very confused. Um, but he also says very smart things too. So, um, <laughs> so this is um, really something that I, I picked up on and I really liked from an interview that um, him and Sinks did in The Guardian. Um, so it's talking about the journey that they've been on and how much they've changed. So they didn't start out being a digital product studio. Um, they were making apps, trying things out, and I'll talk you through a little bit about some of the things they tried out and what we're working on now later. Um, but I think this kind of attitude, it's the mindset, the stance that you take as a leader that's so important. And when you're as influential a personality as Mills is, that just sort of flows through your whole organisation. So just recognising that when you are an inspiring leader, how much weight you actually have, how much influence you have. So this attitude, I think, makes my job a lot easier. Um, the other thing is that he's so excited by change, this kind of spirit of it is, is great. We like newness and confusion and the, and the tricky stuff. And we've now managed to get a whole 250 other people to join um, Mills on that journey. So we've got four studios. Um, we are in London, that's the original um, base. We're in the T building in Shoreditch. Um, and then we have studios in Malmo in Sweden, um, in New York, and in um, Sydney. So Sydney's our baby studio. And we also have a game studio. So We've got a lot of nationalities in the mix, and even those contexts, those countries that we're based in, have really different contextual cultures and employee rights and kind of norms that exist. So keeping what's special about our culture um, within those different contexts is, is quite a challenge, and a particularly scaling culture. Um, so this is a silly video from one of our all-company holidays, I think, last year when um, we got everybody together in Portugal. Um, so, kind of following up from um, Mark's great talk there, um, our spaces are also very special. So, actually, London is one of the first spaces and now needs some refreshing. Um, so, we're starting to look at how it's serving our, our needs and doing a lot of co-creation right now. Um, but the main thing is that these are spaces that we come to be creative, and that requires quite a lot of flexibility. Um, but they are also imperfect so they're kind of the the tea building is in industrial space so it's already got that really nice background but we've got 
um, lots of silly memes and stuff stuck up on the wall. It's quite a kind of startling vision when you first come in, lots of kind of silly graffiti and stuff. Um, but that's all about our personality shining through. And these are also um, spaces that are welcoming. So it's really important for us that we get a lot of inspiration going in. So we welcome in speakers a lot of the time. So people who can hopefully um, will have field work coming in to, to, um, to do the talk that we saw yesterday. Um, but that kind of inspiration and having a space where you can, you can do that and, and come together is really important. Um, so our, our current challenge is that we've been um, looking into those human needs and actually lots of, um, now we've sort of started to work a lot more with technologists, that the need for quiet spaces for deep work um, in contrast to those highly collaborative, more energetic spaces is something that people are really asking for a lot. Um, so it was um, through talking about remote working that this surfaced, that it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to be at home specifically or not in the studio, it was just, I need some quiet time. So we're looking at how to manage that. Um, so this is a bit of an old quote. Um, this is a Peter Senge one. I like this definition because it's not one of the ones from one of the books. It's one that he um, described in an interview in a bit more of a kind of human language. Um, and I feel like this completely describes us too. And, it, and being a learning and development lead, sometimes, um, well, that job can have a lot of um, varied responsibilities across different types of organisation. But um, in an organisation like us two, I'm really lucky because people want to do stuff together. They're all very curious and very creative people. So they're sort of hyper-engaged. So we're often um, having conversations about the things that we all care about. Um, so to kind of um, lay it out for you, there's, I'll, I'll show you our values a bit later. Um, but these are the kind of core concepts that come up a lot. So being human, JFDI, and Saxalia. And I will try and explain those in a bit more detail. Um, they probably don't mean a whole lot at the moment. Um, but this relates to... Um, we've actually spent quite a bit of work um, developing our current cultural manifesto. So we've been um, in business over 10 years now. So Mills and Sinks have spent quite a lot of time um, reviewing where they're at with those... Um, with how we talk about what our culture is. Um, and, um, and this is kind of being called the welder manifesto internally because it's like, it should be welder, it should be stuff that's so natural um, to, to our um, us to bees um, when they hear it. Um, so it's keeping it human, it's just fucking do it, and it's um, freedom to fail. So I'll explain more about those in a minute. So, um, the way that we work also echoes the, kind of the, the approach to learning and development that I've been implementing. So, I previously worked in a product development role, so I'm quite um, kind of close to how we develop things as teams um, on our client side of the business. Um, and we, um, we use a blend of different things, so we're not sort of um, devoted um, people in terms of any one practice, but we use a blend of lean and agile and lots of other kind of um, human-centered design techniques. Um, but basically we work in small cycles, and um, this is the um, kind of classic, if you're familiar with lean, the kind of build, measure, learn cycle. So this is about everything that you make is something that you can learn from, that you don't have to build the whole thing and then discover how customers interact with it. And actually, um, a lot of the conversations that I had yesterday with um, people in this room have been about how you implement things and how you convince your leaders of change. And, well, I'm really inspired by what I heard yesterday, but no one's going to say yes to that. Um, actually, doing these things small and, and validating your hypothesis is a really smart way to do it. So with um, learning and development, I kind of take that same approach. So helping us to be is when they're working, and um, we work kind of like most um, client-facing uh, models in a, a sort of billable hours amount of work. So we aren't spending all of our time holding hands and talking about culture, we're doing the work for our clients. Um, and so you only have small amounts of time to work on yourself, but you want to make it really meaningful. Um, and so thinking about much smaller cycles of development, thinking about what you can commit to, what you can actually do, and then reflecting on it regularly. And I think that kind of echoes the same things that a few people said yesterday about reflecting regularly, making sense of, of, um, of the actions that you're taking. And so um, I'll explain a little bit more about how that works in terms of our product stuff. Um, so if you're not super familiar with um, the lean um, product development, the idea is that you're making a workable prototype in a 
space of time so that you can get that into customers' hands and learn from their behaviour. And I think when we're thinking about that from our own development, so um, maybe it's, um, oh, I want to try public speaking for the first time. Um, so I would... Um, maybe sign up to a small way that I could practice that. So I'll commit to in the next two weeks um, speaking, speaking up in the next client meeting and I'll get some feedback from my colleagues on how that went and I'll reflect on it one-to-one um, -one with my coach. Um, and then I might try and scale up and with that feedback I can be a better public speaker the next time I speak at the all-company meeting and so on. So um, instead of going, I'm going to become a perfect public speaker and I'll do 10 weeks of um, public speak coaching and then I'll do a TED talk, it's kind of dialing it down, trying stuff out. Um, so relentless reflection, these are some pictures from an exercise that we ran at the end of last year. So this was a kind of retro as a studio. One of the most important things, at least in my opinion, about using Agile process is um, the retrospectives that teams do about, it's actually looking at how we're doing, how we're doing in this process and how we're doing as a team. And our team coaches are such a vital component of how we work because they facilitate those conversations, moments when we're able to give each other feedback about how it's been going. And we do that really regularly. So I kind of got people to take on that same mindset and think about their own retro of the, of the period they'd been through. So you can kind of just about see here there's a timeline. So it says the year that dot, dot, dot. And we sort of mapped out the year. And then we did um, pair coaching exercises around that. And there were other exercises that we did, um, generally about um, thinking about the information that you've had, what's gone well, why hasn't it gone well. And actually, there's so much learning. That scale is actually, people were allowed to make their own scale because it depends the way that you look at things, but kind of a highs and lows. So looking at the things that didn't go so well and thinking, what strengths did I use there, rather than like, I'm a winner, what am I amazing at, is actually a much richer seam to look at because that stuff, when you actually keep track of it, can mean that you, when next time you're going through something that's difficult, you've got a list of ways in which you got through it last time. So just helping people actually dig through what's going on really and taking the time out to do that is an investment, taking people out um, to spend this time with their colleagues. And a lot of the time, these were like end of day with beer and, and bowls of sweets and that kind of thing. So um, it's still got a nice kind of um, togetherness spirit. Um, the guy at the top there is a big Jason Statham fan, so I'd, when it came to his group's workshop, I'd put Jason Statham on the final slide um, <laughs> uh, and made him a special Jason Statham book. Um, <laughs> so um, so um, this is also a thing that we're really into us too. So um, one of the ways in which we make products that can sometimes be challenging to clients is the fact that we will always ask for feedback from users, um, customers, um, at every stage um, of building. So we'll share prototypes early, we'll share ideas and concepts early and get feedback on those. So it's, it's interesting that quite often as individuals we shy away from asking for feedback until way, way later in our journey. Um, and so actually we sort of um, de-risk feedback by trying to make it something that happens all the time and happens really regularly and it isn't something that links to your performance so it's not the comments that you make will affect someone's salary which would, is just such a burden <laughs> um, it's more about the feedback that you give is something that can help someone improve so it's all about mindset and attitude and I think we picked up on that twice yesterday which is why you give feedback. So we just, we'd use this model, it's our most simple model that we use, we've got a couple of other ones that we recommend, but the thing that goes with this is a training, so actually spending quite a lot of time with a team to talk about what's good feedback, how does feedback feel, talking about bad feedback experiences, what can we learn from those, and then actually we, we look at what the sort of grief cycle is of receiving feedback, good or bad, and those kind of stages of denial and batting it away and then finally maybe digesting it and then thinking about how you could use it. And all of that conversation makes it a lot easier to then be able to have a shared way of doing feedback. So we always ask permission, for instance. So sometimes you're not feeling that resilient. You don't want someone to be like, 
uh, yesterday in that meeting when he did X. Um, <laughs> so um, so this, is, this is the way that we do it. And it's, and it's about saying what you value about someone so that they can keep working to their strengths. So the places where they're actually creating lots of value for the team rather than worrying loads about weaknesses. But we don't actually um, shy away from talking about our um, kind of blind spots. So the what I'd like to see more of you um, question, the uh, statement is really nice because um, it's actually building on an existing behaviour. So you might say, um, when we do team stand up in the morning, you always come with this real like great energy. Um, and I'd really like to see that next time we're in the meeting with the client. Um, it's about saying, I know you've got this um, in your toolkit, like let's see it in this different context, rather than I'd like you to just sort of be a different kind of person actually, and that's about my needs. Um, so um, actually looking out for why you're giving feedback and making it about the person that you're, you're giving it to. Um, the other thing is actually that we acknowledge that feedback is just about the person giving it to you. It's, it's about gaining perspectives on the people that you work closely with and finding out how you can make that collaboration smoother. Um, so it's also completely your choice how you use that. Um, so I want to talk about JFDI. Um, this has been my own kind of journey, which is that I have in the past um, been a bit of a perfectionist. And I'd worked in um, environments where perfectionism was enabled. So uh, kind of rules and things were expected to be done a certain way or to a certain standard before they leave, um, leave your hands. So it's like um, typos and things like that. Oh, so embarrassing, a typo. Um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And actually, what I really like about the JFDI thing being so core to our culture is it's like forced me to not take that stuff so seriously. And you start to look at what what actually matters um, so this is also about asking for forgiveness not permission and having people really senior in the company really mean jfdi not being like yeah go for it innovate but only if it works um, so this is um this has been really good for me on a personal level but i think it's also also a really good thing for us on an organizational level because these kind of little catchphrases are things that hold us to account to each other so instead of talking about an idea a lot People are like, well, JFDI it. Um, and it's about saying, well, go on, give it a go, try it out, test your assumptions. And because a lot of the time, we, there are things where you're thinking, well, that could be better. Um, <laughs> but unless you're actually testing it out, um, you, won't, you won't kind of know. Um, and it's a bit scary. So also acknowledging that it's a bit scary. So it's been a real crash course for me. And I didn't get it when I first started. And now I'm slowly starting to understand. Um, so this is also to do with how we work and um, kind of what you can commit to in a short space of time. So thinking back to that product development approach, small cycles, getting on with it, um, doing the like lots of nice stuff and collaborating, getting all the post-it notes out, but we also have to get on with the work. Um, and so I really, I really like that, um, that combination of having the JFDI mindset and the process that we work in. So I'm not going to make you write anything down in your notebooks, but I'm going to just um, sort of throw this out there, which is with your own personal learning and development work, what small thing could you experiment with in the next two weeks? So thinking about a sprint of learning and development, what could you actually change? What's the shippable difference that you could make in your working life? So, and also think about what could you do imperfectly in that frame of time? So not like write the perfect conference speech, but maybe try out something for three minutes at uh, the next Pecha Kucha you're at. Um, so talking about stuff that we try out that sometimes doesn't work, um, this is Monument Valley. Who knows about Monument Valley? Or has played it. So it's um, this is an iOS game um, that our game studio made, um, and it's the thing that we're most known for um, in the industry, and it's won lots of awards, um, and it really is a beautiful experience. I'm not a video games kind of person, but it's a kind of Escher-based um, kind of optical illusion, beautiful atmospheric um, game. And so lots of people who wouldn't normally play games had got into this. And it's even been played by the president. If you watch um, House of Cards, um, you might have seen it. Um, but the thing is, we... Um, we don't often acknowledge <laughs> that um, that wasn't our kind of... We didn't just make that and then we were successful at games. Um, 
you don't kind of uh, get that kind of result overnight. And so this is where I wanted to talk to you about being a work in progress and Succalia. Um, so um, this is like Monument Valley has become this real kind of totem of what we're amazing at. But a lot of people don't know that we released about 25 completely unsuccessful products prior to that coming out. Um, things that failed commercially. Um, but the thing is, we've learned from every single failure that we've had. So they're not total failures, they're not write-offs, because they've made us the studio that we are, and we wouldn't have been able to make Monument Valley unless we learned all of the things that we had from those experiences. Um, so that's why Mills calls this a success um, I wanted to also flag, when talking about that, about the other theme that's come up quite a lot in the last couple of days, which is about vulnerability and shame and embarrassment, those kinds of things. So. Part of not being perfect is about being able to talk about not being perfect and acknowledging that. And I think um, that requires a personal vulnerability. So just thinking about how much in your day-to-day -day job you spend trying to like, make sure that everyone knows that everything's under control and actually being able to talk about the blockers and the things that aren't going quite right and how that might actually help you. Um, so, and I think this is something as a, as a leadership journey thing, I used to work in leadership development as well, um, is that idea that as a leader you have to seem like you've got it all together, um, that that's your main responsibility. And I think something that people really respect Mills for is the fact that he'll talk about the things he doesn't know. And he'll ask for help with stuff and work through other people. And it is all about hiring people that are much cleverer than you to do the stuff that you can't do. Um, so I really like that attitude and that mindset. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk about personal impact, what you can do at work towards what your organisational purpose is. So, the things that your company is saying matter, um, what you're collectively trying to achieve, and what, how much you can kind of work to that rather than um, all the other things that maybe become, create reactive work, which is then that feeling of not quite accomplishing what you wanted to accomplish during a day. Um, so we actually do some trainings around this um, to help people have more impact at work. It's actually a lot of soft skills training, so it's stuff like our feedback training, it's stuff to do with active listening, um, presentation skills and so on. Um, but this is a kind of more formal lens way of looking at it. Um, so we've got... Um, a foundational thing, which is us two's vision, um, our kind of global stance on how we're trying to appear in the world, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and we've also got our kind of um, local studio objectives, so what that studio's ambition is in any given year. Um, so the way that we are um, helping us to be navigate this kind of semi-flat, quite complex self-organising structure is by um, getting better at expectation setting. Um, so that clear communication of what's important. So if you are a leader, are you being really clear about what the most important thing is, about where we're trying to get to? Because that's the thing that can lead to that sort of paralysis and confusion. Um, because we work in um, project teams, um, that actually becomes a mini organisation that you're part of at any given time. So if you're um, working on the Sky Kids app with a dozen other us 2 bs you might be co-locating at their studio and be in our studio a couple of days a week and um, you're just completely in the zone with your team. Um, that is, um, that's kind of a second organisational vision that you'll have. You'll have a product vision, you'll have new teammates who are from another organisation. And so that's actually a kind of another thing that you need to be accountable to. So actually remembering what are we working towards for team success. Um, and we're really lucky because we use quite an interesting approach to this. So um, instead of having a traditional project manager who concentrates on making delivery targets, we have a teamwork coach who um, facilitates workshops, um, focuses on team dynamics, and also the successful delivery of the product. But when you're self-organising, when you're helping people take charge of the work that needs to be done, make group commitments to stuff, it is more of a facilitation role, it is more of a workshop culture. Um, so our team coaches are amazing. Um, and they will support the team on getting where they need to go. Um, the kind of next layer in this uh, funny pyramid is about quality. So what does good look like? And us two's heritage is actually what we call pixel perfect design. So really, really beautiful, arresting visual design. Um, and the same goes for our other disciplines, so our other core disciplines um, 
in, in technology and also in UX kind of service design side of things. So being really on top of your game, we, we couldn't work with the clients that we work with unless we could promise to be the standard that we are. Um, the way that we support people to know what good looks like um, is, is through their community of practice. So each of our directors has an, a sort of divisional area vertical that they look after and they will be kind of setting the standard and, and um, the expectations from this kind of uh, local leadership team level. Um, but the community of practice come together as peers to say what's good, what's happening on their project. Because when you're, um, the kind of silos in our organization end up being the project team. So if you're um, kind of cracking some new technology or trying out some new transitions on your product, you need to help your colleagues who are on another one know about that quite quickly um, so that we're all sharing knowledge all the time. So those get togethers happen on a weekly basis. Um, and sometimes they'll include people from the external community of practice like um, industry leaders in those areas or people who are doing kind of um, sort of parallel things that might be interesting, so points of inspiration. So that's really important. Um, and then kind of the top of the pyramid is about personal dreams, is about the individual's aspirations. Like what have they come here to achieve and what will they feel satisfied leaving having done? Um, and, and that is supported one-on-one. -on -one. So we have an internal peer coaching program um, that helps people along that journey. And sometimes, especially when you're a young person, especially when you're a creative person, it can sometimes be hard to know what your dreams are exactly. And we actually don't put any pressure on people to nail that down. But we do help people move towards what their kind of purpose feeling is. And also to look at... Um, kind of th those short cycles of development. So actually over the next 90 days, what do you want to progress on? How do you want to move the dial? It's not necessarily gonna be kind of really clear, um, smart targets in that sense. Um, the reason why there's two arrows on the far side here is actually that these things go both ways. This isn't a foundational thing where we um, sort of push the organisational objectives and we hammer in those team objectives and we tell them like this is what Pixel Perfect is and hope their dreams fit in. It's actually a two-way conversation and we have those conversations really frequently and we have them globally as well. So what do we think about this? Do we want to work for this client? Those kinds of things. Um, and it means that where the uh, us tubies want their want the company to go is also feeding into our vision. And that's why we've ended up with a well der kind of cultural manifesto. Um, so this kind of feeds into us doing work that we care about. And another way that we um, fit learning and development in is in event time. So those, um, those times when you're between client work or when you're um, not working full time on a client project. Um, and this is Mood Notes, which is a really wonderful product. It's actually one of the apps um, from us two that I use the most. Um, and it's a mood journaling app that we made in partnership with um, Thriveport, who are CBT specialists. Um, and it was actually, I think it's still is the first um, product that's actually um, for um, sort of mental well-being that's actually based on CBT expertise. A lot of the products on the market aren't really grounded in science, so we're really proud of it. And it had a dedicated team and time to be spent on it. Um, and, it's, and it really is a lovely tool. So it's um, something to kind of track your moods, and there are download functions and lots of um, really nice kind of exercises that you can do. And what I like about it is the face is just a sort of very simple interaction where you can kind of swipe up and down for how happy or sad you are. And what's been really nice is that these little faces have made their way into our kind of lexicon in terms of how we talk about things. So we've got them as custom emojis on Slack. So when something's depressing, <laughs> you can put like a super grey, really, really sad face on it. Um, and we used those in that timeline reflection activity where people had those stickers to be like, oh, that was when things were amazing. And I was like, a yellow smiley. Um, so we'd discovered that mental health and well-being was something that us tubies were really passionate about across um, our other studios as well. And this is Pause, which has a kind of lovely lava lamp type interaction. And the idea is it's a mindfulness, take 10 minutes out kind of um, activity. And um, I'd recommend just uh, downloading it and giving it a go because it is just lovely. Um, so actually giving people purpose for work, stuff that they care about, is probably the best retention strategy you can have. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate um, when you're in the kind of... Um, area that we work in where we're looking for um, 
technically literate people who are super creative and really kind of curious and interested in innovation, that um, it's a really challenging talent market. So it's competitive. And when people like Facebook will pay loads and loads of money, we have to think about what what matters, and um, actually we get the best people because they're the people who want to work on tricky problems. Um, and so I really love seeing work like this come out of the studio. Um, so just to kind of flash back to that retro exercise, this is a little um, exercise that um, I wanted to share, and you might have done this um, before, but it's one that I think is useful to remember, particularly if you're thinking about career changes or starting a new project. Um, and it's basically a very simple retro set of questions. So what thing do you want to collectively stop doing, start doing, carry on doing as a team? Um, and you can do this for yourself. Um, I quite like doing a... Um, what do I want less of, more of, the same amount, and um, what things am I puzzling over? And just being able to map those things out can sometimes help you realise, oh, actually, there's something I can stop doing straight away, and I don't even have to ask anybody, but it's just something that I've been doing for a long time. So that's kind of another reflection question that might be nice for you to think about. Um, so I'm just going to flash through our values and then I'll um, shove off so we can all have a break. Um, <laughs> but these are our values and they probably are quite similar to lots of other tech startups' um, approach to things. Um, but these really matter to us and they've actually been slightly refined recently. Um, and sometimes it can be a bit confusing thinking about us two um, because it's so many things. It's a ventures incubator and it's a place where you can work on your own IP and it's also a place where I'm doing client services work and it's also a place that I play beer pong and hang out with my best friends and sometimes watch amazing inspiring lectures and, um, and work with young people from the community on building their skills and it's it's a lot of things. So we try and remind people what it comes back to. And so be human is kind of a foundational thing. So it's about actually just acknowledging that we're all inconsistent, imperfect people. Um, being natural, bringing, not kind of bringing your whole self to work because there's no actual pressure to do that, but being real, being authentic at work, being able to say, do you know what, actually I'm really tired today and I don't think I can bring what I need to to this um, interaction is okay. It's not all about being like super happy because that can sometimes come across with these kind of, uh, these kind of cultures. Um, we also encourage everybody to use the freedom. So that's the one that I probably was struggling a bit with when I first started. And people were like, you can do anything. And I was like, oh, what am I allowed to do though? Um, so that's been, really, that's been a really magical one for me. Um, raise the bar is about, um, it's not about doing things slapdash um, and sort of sloppy just because we're doing prototyping. It's about building the best thing, building amazing products that change people's lives and um, actually still having that like, high standard approach. And that's the kind of heritage of Pixel Perfect and about making BAFTA award winning games. Um, Learn together, obviously I love this one, um, but the togetherness is actually one of the most important parts of it. So it's actually about um, us coming together and swapping notes and being like, what's working, what's not working, um, and figuring it all out together, that being that work in progress um, as a group. Um, and enjoy the journey, which is going to kind of link to what I was going to talk about next, which is about life's really short. And we do spend lots of time at work, and we want people to um, be able to have a laugh and to um, feel loved and appreciated. And so um, I think this one is probably one of our most important kind of cultural nuances, which actually ties nicely to the be human thing. Um, and this is a picture of a dog, which might not make sense right now. Um, but this is a really nice story, which is about our founder Mills again. So um, when we first started out, um, Mills had a corporate client who would never pay on time. And if you've been in a startup, you'll know how important that is, <laughs> um, actually getting the cash in. Um, and they'd rung and, and called up and stuff, and no one had um, really responded. Um, so he wanted to know who was this person behind the corporate email. And he found out that it was a lady who really liked bulldogs. Um, so from then on, he, um, he would send the invoice with a colourful picture of a bulldog. Um, and the fact that you can know that that's the kind of thing you're allowed to do at us two 
can kind of help inject a bit of humour and a bit of a naughty spirit in all of us. Um, so um, my kind of uh, takeaways that I'd want to leave you with is just to say, you know, forgive yourself for being imperfect. We're all on a little bit of a self-acceptance journey. And sometimes when we can acknowledge that we don't need to be perfect, then we can acknowledge that other people don't need to be perfect either. And I hope that that can help us move away from this idea of being resources. Um, so we actually are called the people and culture team at us too. Um, so being human also means laughing at yourself, that's a big part of that journey, and just um, being full of contradictions. Don't put yourself in a box. Mills is an amazing businessman, um, but you wouldn't know it from a sense of humour. Um, something that I'd read recently um, was about um, longevity in companies. So I think the average length of time that people stay in a Silicon Valley company is something like 15 months. Um, we actually have a lot of young people who've been at our company for their whole 20s. Um, and I found this really unusual when I first started. And I think that investment in culture, that this is a place that I want to stay, um, means that people act slightly differently. There's ownership there. Um, and this is from a blog post about um, Johnny I from um, Apple, about how long he stayed in his, his role there. And um, it was a kind of a question that, um, that this design director from Twitter had left his blog with, um, which was, if you knew you, could, you were going to stay at your company for the next 20 years, um, what would you do differently? And I really like this question, because sometimes I'm thinking, what great things can I smash out, and then I'll be you know, hired for the next amazing thing, and actually feeling like I belong at us too, and what do I want the impact of my work to be in 10 years' time, is just another lens to look at things through. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh